describes the rebellion of Korah, one of the most infamous people in the Bible, right? A type of Satan, if you will, in that he had an important position. He was a leader among the Kohathites. He was the first cousin to Moses and Aaron. He was a Levite. And they had the privilege and the responsibility of carrying the sacred furniture of the tabernacle from one location to the next, all right? But they were discontent with that privilege and uh, opportunity and responsibility and uh, wanted the privileges and responsibility of Moses, Aaron, and the two priests. And that reminds us of Satan because Satan uh, probably had the highest position ever given to a created being. But he was discontent with that. He wanted the almighty throne of almighty God. So both Korah and Lucifer were corrupted by pride, thinking that they were a whole lot better than they really were. And both of them were false accusers. Devil means false accuser. And we know that Korah and his following accused Moses and Aaron of self-promoting themselves and leading the children of Israel out of Egypt to kill them. But they were guilty of self-promotion. And we think about Lucifer, he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. While Korah led 250 of his followers to believe that they, would be, they could be priests without God's appointment and approval. Both Korah and Satan uh, despise dominion and speak evil of dignities like it talks about in Jude 6. Furthermore, they both influence many to rebel against the Lord with them. Jude 6 tells us about what happened to those who followed Satan over in Jude verse number 6, chapter 1. No, you got it? Jude 6? Okay. I know I'm out of order here. What else is new, right? Uh, here we go. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation... He hath reserved an everlasting chains un, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And we saw last week where the followers of Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and On were swallowed up by the earth, and the 250 outside the tabernacle were toasted by the fire of the Lord. But isn't it wonderful that the rebellion ended in verse 35? And the Hebrews repented of their discontent and agreed with the Lord that he knows everything what he's doing perfectly, and that he selected just the right leaders for them. As a matter of fact, God instructed Moses to take the 250 censors that those fellows who were no longer there left on the ground and to melt them down and make lids for the brazen altar to commemorate what happens when people rebel against the God-appointed leaders. Now, of course, we're talking about this being a memorial for future generations. Why? Because, oh, this generation has learned their lesson well after the Lord's dramatic smackdown, right? I mean, they repented of their discontent and rebellion and are now praising God for their leaders and for their future and for God's plans. No, that's not the case at all. Verse number 41, please. We're in chapter 16. Verse number 41, but on the morrow, wait a second, not a decade later, not a few years later, oh no, not a few months later, not a few days later, on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, ye have killed the people of the Lord. Is that true? No. No. The Lord dramatically and emphatically and instantaneously and publicly killed about 300 rebels. That is what the Word of God says, verse number 31. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. Moses didn't do that. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appertained to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel were round about them, fled at the cry of them, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And they came out of fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Question? Was Moses and Aaron clapping as this was going on? Oh, no. 
for the third time. The first time was the debacle uh, with the golden calf. The second time was the fiasco with Kadesh Barnea. But this is the third time that God has decided to wipe out the entire nation. And all three times, Moses interceded to save millions of hides. But so same people that were literally saved by the intercession of Moses a day before that are accusing Moses of killing 300 people. You cannot make this stuff up. Now, I know Moses became disqualified at the end of the 40 years by striking the rock twice, and he couldn't get into the promised land. But how he made it 40 years, I have no clue, because I couldn't make it 40 minutes. He was the meekest man in all the earth. But wait a second, he wasn't the meekest man who ever walked on this earth. Who was that? Moses is a precursor of Jesus Christ, who not only was rejected by Jewish people, not only falsely accused by the Jewish people, but crucified by the Jewish people. And as he's being crucified, he says, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And guess what? He's coming back a second time to save and deliver the Jewish nation. Verse 42, please. And it came to pass. When the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Hey, listen, when you mess with God, God's kids, you can only expect God to show up and defend them. Amen? I'm telling you, the best security system you can have is being in the will of God, because that will afford you 24-7, 365 protection. Amen? Amen? Oh, yes. Hey, we've been, we've been working on Psalm 91. Turn there for a second. Psalm 91. And uh, we ought to all be working on Psalm 91. I heard a half an amen on that, okay? All of us ought to be working on Psalm 91, uh, committing the word of God to our heart. Let's do it together. But anyway, I'm on Psalm 91, verse number 1. Say it with me if you've got it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let me read two. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Together, please. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Let's alternate. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Together, thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Back to number 16, verse number 43. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation. Uh-oh, uh-oh, number four, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. This is the fourth time that Almighty God, the Creator, the founder of the nation, the head of the nation, wants to wipe the slate clean and start from scratch with Moses, Aaron, and two priests. But Moses and Aaron get on their face to pray and intercede for those who are rebelling, those who are railing, those who are um, uh, revolting against them. And God, for the fourth time, cancels the sentence that he had passed on them, which was total annihilation. Is that, am I reading that right? Verse number 45, it says, Get you up from among them, that I may consume them as in a moment. Okay, so God cancels that sentence, but he still has a sentence, though, a lighter one. Uh, he's going to send a plague, and he's going to do it over time, all right? Now, we don't know the nature of this plague. We just got over a plague, right? So we, 
you know, we can relate a little bit, but uh, we don't know whether the people I got, maybe somebody had symptoms today and maybe three days they were dead. Uh, and then it was highly contagious, probably, it seems like. <laughs> and uh, maybe someone who they breathe on or touched or whatever would get it. As soon as they got the symptoms, three days they'd be dead. Okay, or it could have been faster than that. I have no idea. It could have been slow. But one thing we do know is that at a certain point, Moses told Aaron to take his censer with the coal and the incense in it, run out to where the plague was, and go out to where there's infected people over here and just try to get in between the infected people and the, uh, the clean people, the ones who are not infected. Just get between those who are uh, defiled and those that are clean, those who are unhealthy, those who are healthy, those that are alive and those that are going to die. The sentence of death is in them. They will die. Verse number 46. And Moses said to Aaron, take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun and Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. Behold, a plague was begun among the people, and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700. That's a lot. That's a lot, but it's not 2 million. And if you divide that by 2 million, you get less than 1%. That's where the title of the message comes from, right? 99 plus percent saved, right? Okay, verse number 49. Now, uh, um, let me finish 49. Beside them that died about the matter of Korah, so there was 250 plus the followers and families, maybe 300. And Aaron returned unto Moses, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. What a beautiful, what a powerful picture of our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. He left his incredible position in heaven on the right hand of the Father, came into this sin-cursed world with urgency and emergency, and uh, came to a sin-cursed world and stayed the plague of death that all mankind deserves because we're all guilty of pride and rebellion and despising God's authority. Yes, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. There is a way that seemeth right to man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The wage of sin is death. And we're all infected with sin and deserve to die forever. But Jesus stood. Oh, boy, he stood. Even on that, even on that device of Roman torture, he stood, you see, to make atonement. Not to offer up just incense and prayer, but to offer his blood, offer his body to atone for our sins. 47, Aaron took as Moses commanded, ran into the midst of the congregation. Behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made atonement for the people. He stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Yes, the dearest and best made atonement for you and for me, standing between the living and dead. Even on Calvary, he was between the living and the dead. Here's this one guy who deserved to die, uh, but yet he repented, made Jesus Christ his Lord and Savior, and was quickened and made alive, amen. But the other one, and he's still alive, but the other one, also deserving to die, uh, did not repent, and so therefore died and is still dead. The day before Aaron runs out, Okay, to make atonement, there's 250 wannabe priests that also offer up incense to the Lord, but instead of pleasing the Lord, instead of atoning for anything, the Lord consumes them. And uh, here we have Aaron, the only approved high priest who is a precursor to our high priest, Lord Jesus Christ, who's the only one qualified, worthy, and approved of God to intercede for sinners successfully and atone for our sin. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by him. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen? So it's pretty obvious that God's judgment, remember now, last week, God's judgment on Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and on, hardened the hearts of the people. But what Aaron does represents the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who came not into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
So we see in the Old Testament the Lord getting his attention, getting the attention, trying to get the attention of people uh, with judgment. But then we see in the New Testament, oftentimes the Lord uh, capturing the hearts of people by grace. Now, the three previous times that the Lord spared his people from judgment because of Moses' intercession, Moses pray, prayed, the Lord heard his prayer, the Lord changed his mind. But in this scenario, God wanted a very unique type of intercession to take place. The other three times, the intercession was private. It was Moses and the Lord. Maybe a few people knew around there. Maybe uh, uh, they learned afterwards, okay? Uh, but in this particular case, uh, we have a public intercession by Moses, another person whom the people despised and wanted to oust. This was an opportunity for God to confirm that Moses and Aaron were his appointed leaders, and he wanted the people to understand that. Next time we get together in number 17, the Lord even brings across a more powerful a means of communication, uh, putting his confirmation upon Moses and Aaron as his leaders. So certainly, the primary application of this passage is for us to understand, appreciate, and praise the Lord for the incredible intercession made by our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he stopped the plague of pride, rebellion, and death by offering his life as an atonement for our sins, which was accepted as a sweet-smelling savor by the Father. But please consider that Jesus' intercession did not end on Calvary. No, the Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. Also, 1 John chapter 2 says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who pleads his blood for the believer and secures our forgiveness as we confess our sins, 1 John chapter 2. Now, another application of this passage that we ought to consider is our ministries of intercession. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we find out that God has given believers a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling sinners with the Savior. On the day of Pentecost, Peter offered himself, and the others offered themselves as intercessors, preaching the gospel as uh, they came between the living and the dead, 3,000, then had eternal life, and the rest were still in their sins. And, uh, uh, and these were people that uh, had the wrath of God abiding on them. These were people that were scheduled. It's a point if a man wants to die in the judgment, scheduled for death, scheduled for eternal condemnation. Uh, but yet, through the intercession of the preaching of the gospel, uh, atonement uh, was secured, and these are forgiven and given eternal life. Romans 10 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be and uh, how shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Oh, yes, that's right. So Aaron's a type of that soul winner who tells people, right, about death and the consequences of sin and knocking on the soul's door to compel people to get saved and to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior before it's too late. It's a point if man wants to die, and then the judgment. Life is a vapor, amen? Very transient. It's like the grass of the field. It's today here today, and it's gone tomorrow. It's like a tale that is told, Moses said in Psalm 90. And uh, that's why 2 Corinthians 6 says that now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day. I've mixed that up. Uh, now, now is, now, behold, now is the day of salvation. I'm sorry. Notice the urgency in verse number 46. Notice in verse number 47, Aaron running, running. Here's a, 90, here's a guy in his 90s, approaching 90 anyway. 83 when this all started. We're not sure where this is in the 40 years. He is running with urgency and emergency uh, because he realizes that one moment can make the difference in someone or a group of people's lives, right? And uh, so uh, how urgent should we be concerning uh, our ministry of reconciliation and getting the gospel to those who desperately need it, right? I was just looking up some obituaries here. Today in the Trenton Times, uh, just one day, 10 people, 10 people. Michael Leahy, 67 years old, one year older than me. Uh, born in, he grew up in New York, and, uh, uh, and life is like a tale that was told. 
And uh, here he is, he went to uh, Rice High School, joined the Air Force, served as a firefighter, later went to graduate from St. John's with a business degree, uh, worked as an auditor. Uh, he volunteered at the West Windsor Fire Company, uh, Station 43. He was chief there for four years. Um, uh, and, and on and on, talks about his, uh, his uh, community involvement, talks about his uh, children, talks about his grandchildren, right? Uh, but look at Psalm 90, please. Psalm 90. We quoted from it. Uh, I'll turn to that. If you want to, you can. Psalm 90. It's another wonderful passage to memorize. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood. They are as they sleep in the morning. They are like grass which groweth up in the morning. It flourisheth and groweth up in the evening. It is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told, right? Hey, I'm going to come and go. And uh, someday you might be talking and saying something about me. A little tale. Oh, is that life? The tale that was told. Here today. Gone tomorrow, right? The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Amen. Hey, we can't respond with too much urgency, with too much emergency to what God has called us to do, to intercede for sinners, to stand between the living and the death. And, uh, uh, you know, the thing is, is if someone were to keel over right now, I mean, just, just someone just, just, just heart stop beating and just on the floor. Brother Zach, not quite, not, not yet. And uh, we need you for Sunday, man. No, okay. So on the floor, and uh, boy, uh, we won't be worrying about finishing the message. Oh, no, no, no. We won't be worried about our texts or our emails. We won't be worried about our social media. Someone will go run for the defib. Another person, chest compression. Someone knows maybe CPR would apply CPR, amen. Do anything we can to revive that life, amen, because of its urgency, the emergency, the call upon us. And the Apostle Paul says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Redeem the time. Let's use the time the Lord has given us, amen. Amen? Because the days are evil. God says it's high time to awake out of sleep. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 34. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. And uh, while we're looking at that, uh, notice the process. The process that this intercession employs. It starts off with prayer. Moses is praying, right? And then Aaron is going. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. And the Apostle Paul says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I speak this to your shame. Amen? Uh, let's make the Lord's last command our top priority. Amen? And may it drive us, may it be consuming passion in our hearts to win our lost loved ones, to win those we come in contact with, to sow the gospel seed in the power of God, to be praying fervently because Moses, remember, this process started with Moses praying, and then it's Aaron going, right? The 120 on the day of Pentecost, they were praying for 10 days, and then they went, amen? And they interceded, and they atoned, and they brought the gospel, and they stood between the living and the dead. Hey, listen, you might be infirmed and can't go out soul winning, but you can pray, amen. And we need your prayers desperately, praying that you would, that God would empower us, that God would arrange the divine appointments, that God would bring about the result of salvation and a new creature in Christ as we're sharing and planting the gospel seed, that the Holy Spirit would germinate that seed and create a new life, amen. Hey, listen, we need to be praying. We need to be going. Hey, Joshua, with his, with his men out there fighting and winning a great victory against the Amalekites, when, when Aaron and her are what? That's Exodus. We did that already, didn't we? They're praying. When they're praying, they're winning victories. But as soon as they stop praying, what happens to Joshua and the men? They experience defeat. Amen? Oh, we've got to pray. We've got to pray. Listen, could you pray for the soul winners? Could you pray that our people 
would, by the grace of God, be able to impact others with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray for divine appointments. Pray for folks to get saved in the service. In the service. Amen. And, uh, hey, there, there are some services that go on where there's a three or four men. They're praying in another room for God to save sinners. Amen. And uh, Spurgeon was an example of that. And uh, he had some young college students come to him and say, uh, we'd like to know the secret of your power. He says, I want to show you, I want to take you downstairs to the boiler room. They said, no, no, we didn't mean uh, the physical power that empowers the heat in this church. Come on downstairs. And they saw quite a few men on their faces before God, begging God for his power. Amen. Hey, that's how Pentecost happened. 120 people seeking the Lord. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. Could you please pray that souls be saved in the Sunday school classes? Amen. We're talking about young people. Uh, we're talking about those who uh, uh, suffer the little ones coming to me. Could be more receptive. Oftentimes I'm more receptive to the truth of God's word. Amen. And uh, we're picking them up and God's bringing them in. And let's be feeding them the word of God and let's be asking for God to empower the Sunday school teachers, to bring the word of God. Let's pray for God to um, empower us in the field, at work, wherever we're at, that God would use us in a great and mighty way. Beloved, the plague of sin and death is spreading all over the planet. And the only answer is for God's people to pray for and go in the name of Jesus to the lost who have not died yet and convince them that the high priest of all humanity has died so that they don't have to die and live so that they can live forevermore. And the moment they believe in Jesus Christ, their Savior, is the moment that the plague will be stayed in their lives, oftentimes their families' lives, and they will be delivered. Amen? How about you, my friend? Hey, Aaron, 90 years old. I don't know how old he was. 85. He was at least 83. He's running out there, and he saves 99-plus percent of the nation by interceding, amen? And God has given us that great privilege, that great honor to intercede for sinners through prayer and through going. I don't, I don't remember the exact words, but Jesus told John and, and others that uh, whose sins you remit, they shall be remit. And Peter, right? Uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's God enabling us, just like Aaron was enabled uh, to stand between the living and the dead and to be used of God as so souls were atoned and lives were changed, and that's what God wants you and I to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, uh, for reminding us tonight as we see this incredible picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, who uh, left uh, the incredible glory of heaven to come to the sin, sin cursed world uh, with urgency uh, to offer up a sweet smelling savor of your sacrifice on Calvary. And so, Father, we thank you. We rejoice in that. And we're also challenged tonight uh, by uh, Aaron going out and being used of thee uh, to save many uh, who deserved uh, condemnation. But we all deserve condemnation. But yet, atonement's available uh, in the window of time that we have. And so, Lord, I pray that our urgency and emergency would increase so we wake out of our sleep as a church and go forth in your power to see many souls saved, and to reach a percentage. You want them all saved. And so, Father, I pray that we would get on the same page, realizing, Lord, that you're omnipotent, and us and you make a majority. And, uh, Lord, you're, you've promised to provide the power and the ability to get the job done. We pray, Lord, that it would indeed get done. Jesus, wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at that. Before 8 o'clock. Anybody have any questions, any thoughts, any comments? Yes.